All right, guys, welcome back to the Performance Playbook. Today, I've got an incredible interviewee, but I've got uh, Keegan Smith. Keegan, thanks for joining. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on, Brenna. Doing very well. Um, so this is an exciting podcast for me more so than most of the other ones because now I'm finally getting to dip my foot into the strength side. And this is kind of one of the main purposes why I started this podcast. But honestly, before we even get into any of that, um, most people see you connected with Ben Patrick, the knees over toes guy, or, you know, all of these really big names within the strength and conditioning realm. But um, I feel like your story starts to get kind of pulled away. Could you walk us through maybe how you even got to this point and how you were so interconnected with all these people? Sure. So <laughs> I'm honored that I'm connected with Knees Over Toes guy, Ben Patrick. You know, I, I had the vision since pretty early in life that we can do this better. And then when I got into understanding training, I had the feeling like we can do this better. And maybe that's the feeling we're really meant to have as men, that we believe that we can do something better. I, I think that's a powerful idea to bring to any conversation. But when I was working myself up as an athlete, I was told I was too slow and I wasn't going to make it because I was too slow. And I kept having overuse injuries. Very common story. I wanted to go to the Olympics and I wasn't athletic enough. And my father was a professional rugby coach. And so he had strength and conditioning staff and he'd studied – physical education, he'd been around professional athletes his whole life. And he told me, you know, you you can never be fast, but you can have endurance, you know, so just work on your endurance and maybe you'll make it. And when I was being told I was too slow to make it, that really hurt. So I became extremely passionate about understanding, is there a way that I can get faster? And at the time, the dogma was that it's genetics. It's really down to genetics. Like so many people said, you can't get any faster. And I didn't know if that was true or not, but I got into strength training also because I was a really skinny kid. I was, all my friends were 10 kilos heavier than me, you know, 20, 25 pounds heavier than me. And I didn't like being the runt. So I got into strength training and it didn't do that much for me in terms of being the runt. I was still the smaller one for a long time, but I got fast and I ended up being one of the fastest. And I did get to a national level uh, in my sport of hockey. I was playing indoor hockey and I had that. So when I understood that, it was a powerful thing to be able to take to athletes. So I'd studied exercise science and I got the opportunity to work with professional players through my father. You know, he was working with those teams. I had to do my work experience. I wasn't particularly sure about where I wanted to go with life. It's, it's funny that I've ended up in this position, but at that time it was, I just wanted to play my sport and, and didn't know what I would do. But, um, because I'd had that experience myself, I always believed I could make any athlete better. And that's been the journey really is looking for where can we make this athlete better. But in my 20s, like a lot of people, I sort of didn't want to settle for the nine to five, didn't want to get stuck and started to look at other ways of living. So I spent a lot of my 20s in Latin America and I learned Spanish and I explored other um, opportunities. I was looking for a cool place to live. I was looking for a cool culture to be a part of. And I never really found what I was looking for. So I ended up going back to professional sports. I worked in rugby again for another four years. And those teams had some good results. Um, but I always had that feeling like there's got to be a better culture I can be a part of. There's got to be something better I can create. Because I had so much time on my hands in my 20s, I was thinking like maybe one day I'll be able to just dedicate myself full time to studying and training and being around other people who have those same goals and same ideals, pretty much like your lifestyle, Brando. But um, <laughs> that's been the fun of it. It's like looking for how to get to that point. And I'm happy to say like by 40, I now have these you know, physical locations all around the world where men are getting after it, they're studying, they're training, and we're, we're experimenting with what's the best you know, way that we can live as well as the best way that we can train. And so that's sort of the, the journey up until, up until now. And I think, uh, the more men who have the courage to get after life in that way to pursue the thing that even if it seems crazy and even if everybody tells you you can't do it, you know, if you, if you keep going after it, you just might. Yeah. And then, so then walking back to that, that initial, when you were working with rugby, you were working in the strength and conditioning realm. Um, what did you see that was lacking within a lot of these, these teams? Initially, when I was in my early 20s there, what I saw with the team that I was connected with was 
a lot of hip mobility issues and they were actually being discouraged from stretching. They were being discouraged from squatting to full depth. It wasn't so much don't put your knees over your toes, but it was like don't go below parallel. Um, and so I saw athletes coming in at 16, 17 years old being better and, and you know, more well-rounded than the guys who were in their 20s and the mid-20s. And I could see that like a deterioration in athleticism happening, even though they were training as professional athletes. Like they were full-time dedicated to being athletes and then they were deteriorating. So clearly there's something up with the system. Um, and I, I was really interested in reading. I was lucky to have a really good mentor there. Hayden Knowles was running the program and he had an athletics background and he knew a lot about, about training. Um, and he put me on to different systems of, of learning. So I was studying like Mike Boyle and, and uh, you know, all the books that were coming out in the States in the early 2000s. He was giving them to me to read and saying, you know, read this and then tell me what you get out of it. And I loved it. And, and that was really how it started for me. And he would give me little projects because I'd be this cocky young guy, you know, thinks he can change the world. And he'd say, well, cool. You think you can fix, you know, that about him? Like take it on as a project. And he would give me like one session with that player. And if that session went well, he would ask the player, what did you think? And then if the session went well, I'd get the second session. And it went like that. I had these little projects with professional athletes and I loved it. You know, I loved being able to see we were testing some some different things and we got some some good results. And yeah, like there was there was a lot there, but I think the biggest thing was that uh, the hip mobility piece was the, the one thing that stood out to me and, and getting to, into that full squat position, which is quite funny because that was in 2004, 2005. It was long before I got into Pollock and stuff or, you know, Ben Patrick was probably in nappies at that stage. It was, it was a while back, you know. Um, but, yeah, there's always something to work on. Any athlete that you that you find, like there's always areas that they haven't, addressed or haven't addressed into the detail that they could and that's the fun of it is identifying what could be the weakest link what could be the thing that's going to make the most impact i think charles pollock was the master of that identifying okay is body composition the weakest link or is the brachialis the weakest link or is and if you can identify the weakest link and change that that's where you're going to get the biggest change in performance it's not the same in business in business you want to double down on your strengths and you know, just cover, get someone else to do the, the stuff that you're not naturally good at. But as an athlete, if you have a weak part of your body or a weak part of your game, like you, you really have to address that. You have to face it, fix it to be able to progress forward. So um, it was, I could always see something that needed work with the athletes that I was working with, and that's probably still the case. And the fun is in figuring out if your, your protocol works. So now that you've been outside of that realm, though, um, it's always frustrating to maybe look at it from a third party perspective, because, again, like the the information takes a long time for it to seep back in. So, for example, like working that full range, maybe there's still a lot of people that might not entirely buy into that. Um, And then plus, it's like like you said, right, there's a lot of like dogma within you know, the, the CSCS, like the, a lot of the American systems, but, um, when do you think it'll change and do you think it is starting to slowly change? Are you seeing a change? ATG and and Ben Patrick is the most influential athletic system of the modern era. Like it's had more impact than any other system and it's pretty early. Like it's, it's early in the piece by followers. There's not too many accounts that are talking about athletic development that have more than you know, 2 million followers. But we know for a fact, like all the professional teams, professional athletes, they've all looked at it. Their athletes are asking them about it. So whether the coach is in agreement, whether the athlete applies it fully, like the system is there now and it's had an impact. Um, and what's coming next, I think, is – pulling more of these different ideas together and the unification rather than going to war with, is it ATG or is it functional patterns or GOTA or all of these, you know, seemingly opposing ideas and, and even the, uh, the Marinovich stuff, which uh, Brian McGinty is, is putting forward now. And 
you know, Joe, uh, Jay Schroeder system. Like there's, there's all of these different systems of training that seemingly oppose each other, but you have to look at what is the problem that they're looking to solve with that. Like Joel Seedman is the one that people love to, to put forward, like be as controversial as you can and be as dogmatic as you can and, and you'll grow a brand. Yeah. Like, um, but there's great stuff within what Joel Seedman is doing. Like I, I would say that there is intelligence within that system. In isolation, I wouldn't say it is a complete system. But if you're working with NFL players, then it's not a. You, you don't need to be a complete system. They've got their stretching coach. They've got their physical therapists, mm. and so it's important to understand like what role is this person playing, and what what are the goals of of what they're doing. Ben Patrick, it was about getting on the court and jumping, being able to jump pain-free. Like that's all he wanted. He didn't want to be the strongest man in the world. He still doesn't want to be the strongest man in the world. He wants to dunk with his son. And so he's solving for that problem. So don't expect to have the most outrageous plyometric program to put 10 inches on your vertical jump in six weeks because that's not what he wanted to solve. He wanted to get back on the court and stay on the court for the rest of his life. And he's throwing down some pretty mean dunks but he's not wanting to be the you know the biggest dunker in the world. So for me, the fun of it is in looking at, okay, what is the problem that this coach is looking to solve? What was the challenge that this, you know, this coach or this athlete, the position that they're in, and then looking for the good things about that and looking for where it sits uh, in, in spectrums and in bigger, bigger pictures of how things fit together. And when you do that, you realize that, there's nothing really to argue about. There's nothing to fight about. It's simply different tools, different goals. The flywheel stuff is is one of the biggest things that no one's talking about yet. Uh, mm-hmm. Flywheel training is much more effective than free weight training in, in many ways, but no one knows about it yet, except for professional athletes and professional sports where, where it is being used quite a lot. But for some reason, the it hasn't got into commercial training facilities yet, and so it's still a relatively unknown. Uh, but we have this opportunity now in the information age like you think about the accumulation over the last decade all the foot training and all the postural development and all of these things it's like it wasn't there it wasn't there the opportunity before to understand the, the breathing and the diaphragm and all of these different things but we have so many like it's so difficult for a coach now and so difficult for an athlete because there's all these different things of like yeah this is the most important and that's the most important and this is the most important the fun is going to be in these next few years of how to combine all of this together and be able to have an athlete who systematically incorporated this into their lifestyle over a period of years and is able to use the tools that are most important for them at the time. Like for you as uh, going towards the Olympics and being a, a, a deep thinker, um, it must be exciting for you also to think of how this, this world can continue to kind of simplify and unify as well as uh, you know, solve all the problems. Yeah, I, I think the the big part is again getting away from the dogma because I've again I've been with a bunch of different uh, strength coaches and some of them are so purely the CSCS system within the U.S. Uh, the NSCA and then you've got you know the purely just the Louis Simmons, just the Poliquin, just the knees over toes. But if you can find a way to actually merge all of them. I think that's where you find the beauty. And I do agree, like being able to start focusing on the feet. And this is something that has made a big difference for me. But, you know, integrating all of these different types of training to build this like perfect system for that individual. Um, that's where it gets really interesting. And I think that's that's where I met you. And I finally got out of the collegiate system. And that's how I found Ben Patrick. And then I got introduced to you. And I was like, oh, wow, like these different ideas, this different way of training actually uh, is getting me back into my sport, which I thought I was done with. I thought I was, I was ruined. And, uh, I think it was three months later, my knee felt good enough to where I could start diving on platform, which I thought was done. So I, I do think these, these systems need to be integrated, um, in a sense to where, you know, if we can't find the right option and we're struggling for months to a year and you're not getting you know, the results that you want, I think people need to start to learn to, again, take out the ego and let's input a different system that makes sense, even in a collegiate system. And I think that's where you guys have really brought this to light. 
yeah, getting people to talk to each other and be able to have a conversation, someone who loves functional patterns or thinks that the mechanics of how you run and the foot mechanics are everything, having them be able to have a conversation with a coach who's had amazing results with ATG system and who doesn't think that the patterns are the most important thing or, you know, have, allowing those conversations to happen and encouraging those conversations is what I'm most excited about over the, the months and years ahead. Like you don't have to pick a team. You can understand this is a tool. If you have an extremely, an athlete who has physics on their side, like for example, the West side barbell method is a fantastic method for putting physics on your side, produce more force, produce that force more quickly. If you have that athlete, but they don't move very smoothly, then the functional patterns type of approach and looking at the postures, work and these kinds of things, they could do wonders. And I have worked with those athletes. You know, I had an athlete who took steroids and he got big and he was banned. And then when he came back, he moved like a robot. He had amazing body composition. He was strong, but he couldn't move at all. And putting him through the West Side system, it, you know, he would have continued to be powerful and maybe like produced a little bit more force more quickly, but probably needed more like Ido Portal's work. Like, let's get fluid. Let's get, you know, able to control the body. And for now, I'm not sure, you know, it's happening. Like on Instagram, you can see some coaches who are thinking like this and they're doing this stuff. Like they're, they're able to press massive weights, but then they can also do a planche. And it's, it's really cool. Like it is happening, but as far as coach education, I don't really see anyone who's kind of putting it all on the table and saying, hey, let's have a discussion. So that's really what I'm doing now, Brando. We haven't spoken for a little while, but if, you know, the Uncommon Success now has a wing. We have the Uncommon Professional, which is anyone uh, wanting to build a business who also values being athletic, who also values uh, having a good family. Like that's the vision of the Uncommon Pro, mm. making more money, being athletic and, and having a great family. But the uncommon athletic coach is someone who wants to have this conversation of like, I'm, I'm willing to learn about breath work. I'm willing to learn about rope flow. And I'm also willing to run backwards and sprint backwards and, and test all these things and see what comes out because I think we can do something way better than what we're doing. And that's, that's the fun of it. It's figuring out how to, how to put that together. And it is, it is a bit overwhelming when you start thinking about that, but if you can simplify it down into the vision for it is like the, the secret source with dense and like with having these like chunks and blocks of training, if we're able to put things into like five and 10 minute blocks, we have so many blocks of training you can do for the week. And there's a certain amount of cost that's going to happen with a certain style of training. The breath work isn't going to cost the same as lifting a maximal weight. But then if you can do a certain block with the, the level of complexity, say with it's like trampoline training, and you, you know you've you've sent me some cool stuff on the trampoline. If you can do you know drop on your bum and get back to your feet, then maybe you can work next on drop on your back and get back to your feet. And then that becomes a more complex sequence. And if you're allotting five minutes of your training time to trampoline, I believe that rugby rugby players should be doing that. I, I think soccer players should be doing that. Like I'm putting this out there to soccer coaches of like, okay, you want them kicking the ball a quadrillion times, but why don't you get them to like very basic level of tricking parkour? trampoline ability and maybe it'll help them to kick balls that they weren't otherwise kicking you know what if they did a, a little bit of taekwondo style training like if you think about the athlete's progression over even once they're a professional right if they go professional at 18 or 20 you have still got like 15 years like how much are they really developing when they're doing the same training all the time like is there is there more that's that's the fun is like asking these questions yeah i i I genuinely kind of felt a a spike in my performance too when I started adding some form of cross training. Um, that was climbing for me and being able to utilize my upper body in a different way just made me feel safer when I was diving. And I just felt like I could understand my body in a more of like an isometric position because there's so much of holding tension while you're climbing. And so it's just a really cool way to actually be able to utilize that within my diving. And um, you kind of reminded me of uh, Clarence Kennedy. I mean, he's an Olympic lifter and they also does tricking and it, it, he's so explosive, but he also moves super well. You'd think he's this bulky, you know, 
like tight guy, but he can move super well. And you, you start to see that within how smooth he moves some of his like snatches and stuff like that. Um, and now we kind of see you like, I, I feel like you maybe have transferred your training into what you brought up and maybe the viewers don't understand what your dense training is, but you do a lot of like EMOM work and it's a lot of calisthenics with muscle ups, handstand push ups. Your handstand looks as good as mine at this point. Um, do you want to kind of expand on that? So yeah, the dense, dense strength, it really came about with the frustration of looking at people training at commercial gyms and being on their phones. It was, even, it was in 2013, so it was before smartphones were the pandemic that they are today. But you would see people go to the gym consistently a few times a week and really not look like they go to the gym. And I was thinking about how can we fix that? And CrossFit was getting bigger and I was looking at what CrossFit was doing. I was thinking, okay, like it can be simpler. But then I saw the CrossFit programming and it was – it was really tricky to follow where they were going with things because they were selling their programs online. So they wanted it to sort of be encoded. So you wanted to stay with the coach for the special source. But I was thinking about like, okay, how do we make this simple so I can give it to everyday Joes that go to the gym. So they start getting some results in the gym. And I'd started doing it for myself just to see what it was like, because it's like, why not? If I'm going to be telling other people to do it, like I should at least know what it feels like. I didn't think it would be any good for athletes. And then I got stronger than I ever been. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And so I started doing it with some of the professional athletes, you know, guys who were, when they were injured and they're like hitting lifetime best on bench press, which is the one movement that they've all done a lot of in rugby. And I was like, wow, this, you know, there's something to this. And so as I do, when I solve something great, I tend to move on to the next thing uh, rather than doubling down on it. So I kind of just let it sit in the background and told people about it on and off. And some of the gyms I worked with adopted it and some didn't, but I, I just kept moving. I, I like solving more things. And I, f I would like to think that within my program now, there's like 50 different businesses, 50, you know, things that need someone to attach themselves to and get out to the world. But the dense thing has really kind of kicked off in the last year or two where Nico Di Paoli's used it really well. And, and he's been doing it with some of the world champion calisthenics guys. And there's some crazy stuff going on within our network now of, and lots of handstand push-ups. Fabian Loak, in, one of the Frenchmen in our community, just did a thousand handstand push-ups in a day uh, two days ago. He did ten thousand repetitions wow. total, and and he did a dense method for the whole day. So yeah, it's like can't imagine anyone ever doing that. And he, I spoke to him yesterday. He's like, yeah, I'm not too sore because like, it's nothing's really super heavy. It, as much as handstand push-ups, you think they're heavy, but when you get in the groove of them. Um, then they're not they're not crazy heavy, so he wasn't even that crazy sore. But that's the cool thing about dense method is you can you can not be as sore, um, you can be more consistent, and it's it's like testing as well, where you get kind of that feedback loop of dopamine and and positivity of like I just beat what I've done before. But if you go too crazy with it, you won't finish the block. So it's it's self regulating as well, and that mm. self regulating aspect is really important. And that was a big problem for me that I would max out too often and grind too often. So when I did dance, I would always, you know, leave more in reserve because you, you basically have to. And yeah, it's, it's, it's such a simple method. And it's been for so many coaches who stress about programming and athletes who stress about programming, it seems so mystical and complex because you see all these Russian systems. And honestly, I think programming is the biggest scam and the biggest thing that people waste energy on. It's much more important to think about the movements. It's much more important to think about that kind of execution of the movements. People don't even think about that at all. What's short range and long range? You know, where in the strength curve is this movement challenging the person? That's barely a consideration. Only a few years ago, I was having fights with people on the internet saying it does matter where on the strength curve the, the sticking point is. And they were like, no, no, it's just how many reps you do on the biceps. Like it's total volume on the biceps. Like that's, that's not true. If you do extreme long range biceps, like layback incline curls, whether you're ending up in a full stretch, 45 degree or flat bench incline, you're going to get an extreme stretch and you're going to get real doms. When you do spider curls or when you do standing curls with the same weight or, or even more weight, you're going to get less soreness and less muscle damage. It's basic physics. Like you know that one of them is going to make the tissue bleed more than the other because one of them stretching and you get that strong sensation of, hey, be careful, something might pop here. And so we should be thinking much more about where in the strength curve the exercise is impacting. We should also be thinking much more about the tempo of it. Is there impulse in the way we're executing this movement 
or is there no impulse? Is it really smooth or is there, you know, uh, uh, an amortization or, or an elastic component to this? Um, so I might be getting too deep in the weeds. I'm not sure who's going to listen to this, Brando, but it's it's stuff that's worth exploring. If you care about athletic performance and there's concepts here that you don't understand, I would encourage you to to dive in and understand that Brando can explain it all to you if you, if you need, but um, this is what we should be thinking about more so than programming. Like it doesn't really matter whether you do three sets of 10 or 10 sets of three or 30 reps or 60 reps. What matters is that you're choosing movements that are going to take you to the point you want to go to and you're using the nervous system in a way that is going to take you to where you want to go to yeah and i I actually found it pretty interesting when i was starting to program for myself i noticed how important the the intentionality of everything was and i really recognized that too when i first learned from the atg program like tempo is like huge it's ginormous like if you're doing a back squat if i just program a back squat what the hell does that mean? Like, what does that mean? How fast are you going to, are you just jumping with it? Like how, how can I like extrapolate something that actually makes sense? And so by utilizing tempo, we can really be intentional with every movement. Um, but, but quickly on the, on the dense before I forget it, if you're programming for someone or you want someone to first get into this dense program, um, are you prescribing this multiple times a day or is it just, Hey, we want one really strong, let's say 10 minute, um, dense program of squats and pull-ups. Um, or is it, is it multiple times a day and you want to cut it up into two or three sessions? It depends. Best case moving multiple times a day is a good thing. And generally people in my network train every day and that's becoming more accepted in elite sport as well. You got NBA teams that are saying, yeah, we, we do some strength training each day. We train after games like, and it doesn't mean you're training harder or it doesn't mean you're getting more soreness. It's actually usually the opposite because everything is kind of sub maximal and you never get too sore. You never really test yourself to the point where it's going to detriment the other things that you're doing in life. For many my network, it's often business, but for you, it's getting on the diving board. And you want your training to complement the things that you're doing there. Um, how many blocks you should do and when you should do them, like it's quite individual. The good thing is that it really doesn't matter that much. Like count your blocks for the week. Do do those you know ten sets of whatever number of reps it's going to be. Like ten sets of one is great. Ten sets of three is great. Ten sets of five is great. Ten sets of twenty is also great if you're doing you know, um, squats, like we've got guys getting after that at the moment. The challenge I'm doing this month is 10,000 squats. The big overriding challenge is 10,000 handstand push-ups in 12 months. When you put it on the clock with the dents, you, you know what you're going to get out the other side and you, you've done it before. So you, 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 it's everything being more standardized just makes consistency in training much more likely. And you get that win of like, okay, I was working on, 10 sets of three chin-ups and now I've got 10 sets of four or I got five sets of four and five sets of three. And next time I'm going to go for six sets of four and, you know, four sets of three. Like it's, it's, uh, it's so much better than the traditional ways of strength training. The thing is like when a new application comes out or when Facebook comes up with a new version of what they're doing or iPhone comes out with a new iteration, everybody knows. And it's almost like you don't have any choice. The, the things stop working on the old apps and you're forced into the new, better technology. In strength training, that's not the case. In strength training, no big tech, no big companies care. Like there's, there's no real money in it. It's not considered like a serious industry, the strength training, even though people do really care about it. But a lot of the money is in shakes and it's in the pants that you wear to the gym. And this is better technology as far as training goes. ATG, dense like understanding range short range long range but the only way it gets out there is if coaches decide i'm gonna get this message across and it, that's literally how it's happening it's like a, a revolution of the people person by person getting getting a message across of hey there's a better way of doing this and it is a shame because a lot of people don't train because the ways that they were taught to train are just crap like i wouldn't train either if i was going to try and do what the way most people train go and sit on machines and do three sets of 10 and it's like, there's nothing interesting about it it doesn't get results whereas once you're doing the things that we're doing like you're going to train for the rest of your life because 
it's it's fun and you want the challenge and it's it's not going to end there's always going to be something cool to work on um, and so it is cool to see the dense message getting across um, i wish that there was a way that it was just you know when there was something that's clearly better as far as technology and training goes like if there was a way to get it to people more directly in the way we get these app updates like that would be that would be a better place yeah so how have you felt physically with this transition to like more calisthenics and I don't know, maybe I haven't seen it, but maybe you're utilizing both more, you know, like classical barbell stuff and calisthenics or how do you feel overall? It's been feeling pretty good. Um, I do miss the barbell. It's, it's not really a choice. It's, it's uh, just that I've traveled all year. I've been like 20 yeah. countries this year and I'm working super hard on my business. I'm homeschooling my children. Like, um, that's why I'm training body weight at the moment is because if I wasn't, I wouldn't be training at all and it needs to stay in my life. So I look forward to getting back on the barbell more when I have, you know, when I was in Florida with Ben, I trained on the barbell there. And uh, when I was in Montenegro, you know, I did there as well, but it was, it is also a great thing. And Nico, the motion guy sort of helped me with this as well. He was just training only body weight. He had his nice gym there. He was doing a set of 20 chin-ups, usually wide grip, and then going straight into 20 pistols each leg, going straight into uh, 20 dips. And um, he was just doing like three or four movements each day. And he was like, yeah, that's all I'm doing at the moment. And he could do his one-arm chin-up. He he was getting his one-arm chin-up in spite of that. It's it's like you can get a lot done with, with just body weight. So it's good to be piecing this together as a whole body system. Um, Justin Mucci, one of the young men in the community, just sent me a hamstring variation yesterday. He's calling it the Mucci curl. And it's like a, a good way to train hamstrings in knee flexion with body weight only. Because I've been doing those funky ones. You might have seen like the the you know the standing pike, um, standing on one foot, sort of getting the head to the shin. That's really good for – I think that helped me unlock my Nordics, to be honest. Like, I was just working on them, and then all of a sudden I could do Nordics. And you get really sore hamstrings if you push the tension into the muscle and it's quite long range. But then he's got this variation uh, where you sort of like a, like a table, like a like a bridge with your butt, um, you know, butt facing towards the floor, hands and feet. And then, you, you know, you're curling your – on one foot, you're curling your heel towards your, your butt. Maybe we can put it in the show notes or something, but it doesn't do well on the podcast. But yeah. There's new variations and new problems being solved because we're thinking about things through this logic of the ATG system and wanting to have like a relatively long range, but we want knee flexion based hamstring, not just hamstring. And it makes you be more creative. And, you know, that's, yeah, it's, it's cool to see that unfold in the body weight uh, scene and, and thinking about how we can apply that stuff. And it's great if you feel like no matter what position you're in, you're going to be able to train. Because I used to feel like, if I can't get to the gym, if I can't get to a barbell, then I can't really train. I'm going to get weak. But I don't feel like that anymore, and that's that's a good thing. And I'd, I'd love everyone else who, who loves training to feel like that as well, where you're still excited to train. You can still get gains. You're pushing your pistols up. You're pushing your handstand push-ups up. You know, your one-arm chin. Like there was never, there was never really an excuse, but I always felt like that. Um, and even just doing crazy high squat volume at the moment, my, my legs are getting bigger, and I'm I'm not putting any weight in my back, um, which is cool as well. Yeah. So you've kind of just found a system to where you really can't produce any excuses. So, hey, I'm traveling to all these countries and I have no time to, uh, to do these things, but maybe you've got three 10 minute sessions. I think anyone can fit that in. So that, that is pretty interesting. So your preference would be to add a, a barbell or add free weights, whatever that looks like to your program. Yeah, I, I do like still having them a gym and I think most athletes should be doing that. Like, yeah, they should have a, a setup with more more variety, more options. Um but to not have it as an excuse is the biggest thing. And that's a pretty good summary in general. Of like let's build a system you build systems robustly enough that there's no excuses. It's the same thing we're looking to do with the business stuff. Like it's 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 not that complicated. If you if you want to do it, if you want to get to work, like here's here's a system, here's a template. Let's get to work. Um, but with the ten, you know, you don't even need to do. Th- th- that's what we've done recently. Is like create this kind of ultra dense 
um, idea. It's called Bodyweight Dance within the ATG app now. Mm. And it's like two, two movements on the same minute. And so it brings a bit more cardio into it. And CrossFit's been doing it. It's not a new invention. But when you train dance with two or sometimes I'm doing three, sometimes I'm even doing four movements. Like I'll do a handstand and then I'll do pistols and then I'll do push-ups and then I'll do squats all in the same minute or the KOT calf raises. You can rack up reps really fast with that. But 10 minutes, you've got a decent whole body workout. And it's not ideal for an Olympian. It's not a sport-specific thing. But it is pretty good for a busy dad if you're like, I don't know if I've got time to train. I'm like, well, here, try this one on. And and it's if it starts with one chin up, two push-ups, three squats, you know, kick up against the wall, happy days. And 12 months from from then, you're doing one arm chin-ups and hands down push-ups. And, you know, then it, that's the thing. Like you can progress it infinitely to the point where it's a super hard workout, but it could be crazy easy for someone who's not very healthy at the time or like don't that's the that's the great thing about it is it's really scalable but just do one push up each minute for 10 minutes do one squat and then the next day do two like soon enough you'll be working hard and you don't have to start with hard workouts yeah that's a big myth as well it's like trying to chase fatigue like don't chase fatigue chase performance mm. so just kind of jumping back really quickly to the atg system itself um, did you ever expect it to get this big? Cause I feel like you guys have, and again, personally speaking, you guys have impacted so many people, not on just the aspect of the knees part. I think that's obviously the, the main ticker for most people is, Oh, my knees feel so much better, but you are looking at, especially me going through the zero program for a bit. Um, you are looking at an increase in mobility. And so you're, you're just making ease of life for a lot of just uh, general population people uh, 10 times better. Did you ever expect it to be this popular? No, I can't say. I can't say it was. <laughs> I, we had the conversation early on of like the world needs to know about this. You've applied the logic of the Poliquin system and things that he was sharing, but you've, you care about the lower body. All the guys would turn up. I went to the Poliquin events. All the guys turned up with their sleeves full. There was big biceps or big triceps, but the lower body stuff, it wasn't what it was, it wasn't what it was about. The way I learned the PICP one and two system, it was like, if they've got problems, then do the step ups and, and do some split squats, you know, once a year for, for a month, like put it in the cycle during the off season. Ben took the prep stuff and turned it into the main, the main meal. He turned the entrees into the main meal. And it turns out that's what the world needed. And it was really like we have COVID to thank for it as well. Like mm -hmm. it was when all the gyms shut, I made a body weight version of what I was doing in, inside a real movement. Ben was working really closely with us, with real movement, my company at the time. And, and he was like, okay, I'm going to build a zero version of this. Uh, and that's been the thing that has been most used. I think it's still by far the most utilized program within the app that was never even going to be a thing. <laughs> like the reason that exists is because we couldn't like, we were locked out of the gyms so we could be healthier you know, for, for many months. Um, and so that's, that's where that thing came about. And you just connect the dots looking backwards, like the Steve jobs thing. It's, it's crazy when you think about it, but we were talking about, you know, who's going to be the ones that are going to get on Joe Rogan and how do we change the way the world trains? Like, I've been asking myself that question since 2013. Like I was saying to myself, I don't know if I can solve a bunch of things. Like, there's many problems to solve in the world today. There's some very, very challenging situations that we can all see. But one thing that I can work on is the training thing. Like we can solve this. The athletic question for anyone who wants to be athletic, like we can solve this. And I still feel as though that hasn't been well enough communicated. And so like Ben doing what he's doing is, is phenomenal. And I would challenge other coaches to dream that maybe they could do 10% of what Ben's done as well, or maybe, you know, maybe double. Like the, the fun of it is in, in testing your ideas and putting your things out there. And so many coaches have taken their craft and taken like public messaging basically, which is in a way, you know, these are like public service messages, what these men are putting up on Instagram now. Those have been inspired by Ben. Like in the old days, this would have been buying time on local television to be able to get a message across of like, Hey, you can fix your body and now you can do it for free and people laugh about it or criticize it. But ultimately 
it's working. Like there, there is a message that's getting across. Like more people are aware of walking backwards than, you know, than, than they were aware of uh, a long time ago. And it's, it's fun to see it unfolding and there's still a long, long way that we can go with that. So I couldn't see that it was going to be like this. Um, but I still think we're only just getting started. I think there's, there's so much more to do. There's so much more to solve with professional athletes, with rehabilitation. And the fun is in the mystery, like staying in the mystery of like, what is the, what are the best, the best methods and the biggest solutions. And, um, it's not going to be one person that's going to be able to really take all of this forward. Like there's, there's so many questions within it. Yeah. And so I kind of want to completely take this in a different realm that you're also very good at, but um, we've seen you in the strength realm. We've seen you build these companies. And uh, one big thing here too is, um, you know, how much you've been able to do with a lot of men and help them kind of get out of ruts and you're, you're making sure that people are, or not people, but more specifically men are being able to, you know, build the dreams, the jobs, the life that they want. And so I wanted to read you a quote, which you've definitely heard already, and you probably already know of, but I kind of want to get your thoughts on it. And then I'll proceed with a, a question from there. But hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. Do you think we're in a time of weak men because our our uh, uh, parents and grandparents have created such such wealth that we've kind of started to falter from there. I was thinking about this again today. I would say there's more men right now who are willing to do crazy tough stuff than any time I can remember, you know, and. Um, you know, that's BJJ, that's ice baths, that's that's lots of different challenges that men are actively putting themselves into. And it's it's in reaction to the to this feeling that okay, we need to toughen up, like we need to we need to get ourselves to a better place. Uh, but I would actually say like there's a huge shift and, and it's not it's not everyone. I mean maybe I'm biased by who I'm looking at and who I'm talking to, but I'm seeing a willingness from men right now to transform themselves to get after it to get up at 4 a.m like there's more people doing stuff that they weren't willing to do 10 years ago it wasn't it's, it's social media you know it's it's the it's rogan and it's all these messages of like let's see what we can do um, i'm really excited for the trajectory that we're on at the moment and it's become clear that no one's going to save us like we need to organize it for ourselves if we want to have a good business like organize it for yourself if you want to have a great body like don't don't wait for the government to mandate you having a great body or you having a great business. Like you got to sort it out. So I see a lot of men getting after it hardcore, and I, I did have more women in my programs in the past. You know, mm. and it just turned out that women didn't really like my stuff. Like it would be maybe three percent uh, of my customers, and then sometimes they would feel a bit awkward because it's like, where's all the ladies at? And I'm like, well, I invited them, but <laughs> they're not here. <laughs> and uh, and so for that reason, like we became uh, men only uh, recently within my like my top end program, and probably should have done it earlier. To be honest, I do think that there is a significant difference between the experience of a man and the experience of a woman, which I probably didn't understand until you know, more of this stuff has come into conversation recently with these debates about what gender is and whether we need to be using pronouns and all of these conversations. They've forced us all to look at, like, what is a man? Is a man different to a woman? Do we need to have different environments for boys and girls? And I hadn't thought about any of this stuff because why would you? <laughs> like, it yeah. wasn't really that important to think about it. And, yeah, now that we think about it more, like, it is important for men to have support and challenge from other men. And a woman is inherently valuable, like it or not. Woman is always going to be in demand. If a woman wants to be in demand and wants to, you know, have a, a partner on any level, or someone to hold her hand, she's going to find someone in ten minutes. If a man wants to find lots of women to hold hands with, he's going to have to have something going for him. Like it's yeah. it's not a given. So our experiences are are inherently different, and that does carry over to the way that we do business and the way that we approach training. Like it's it's in all aspects of life. So. Um, I don't know, what's what's your take, man? Like you, you're seeing this wave of what's what's going on in the world as well. Are we well, are we weak at the moment? 
Well, I think it's interesting because I, I do agree that there's a lot of things changing. Um, it is interesting to kind of see things get splatted on the wall a little bit with social media. Um, and I, my, my meaning by that is you see all of our health officials all over the world being completely obese. And I even wrote down the statistics within the U.S. at least um, by, by the CDC themselves in 2020, you had 60 percent of the population within the U.S. obese. That is the majority of the country out of shape. And so it's it's yeah. our our guidelines and the things that we're following aren't working. And so you see all of these these things clashing because, oh, well. You know, we should be eating vegan diets and these really hyper processed foods that we don't even know. They call it, you know, meat, but it's it's made out of soy and random stuff that I don't even know what it is. And so um, I think we're starting to come up and I think there's a lot of people that are are grinding out of this this hole we've we've built for ourselves. But I think that was one of the things I was I was kind of picking at for you was. Yeah. I feel like a lot of men in today's age are are searching and seeking for mentorship. And you've been able to provide that for so many people with your uncommon success and it's it reminds me of Goggin, right? You're you're trying to be uncommon amongst un, uncommon people, but you the the thought of being uncommon is not even there for a lot of people because well, I'm out of shape and and yeah. I don't feel that great. I eat shit. And so it's cool to see that you're giving men this platform to join a group and that's kind of been uh not really available for a lot of people and so i thought it was a very interesting way that you're changing the culture within a lot of these these groups um do you feel like you've really been able to produce that that huge culture and you think it's starting to you know kind of catch on i guess my answer to your previous question kind of covers that in, in to a sense that I don't think about the 60% that are obese, to be honest. I'm working with the men who've made the decision that they're going to do great things with themselves, and I'm so overly biased towards that. And I created Uncommon Success with the idea of, like, I just want that to be the frame of reference for my son. Like, every man he meets, trains, is building a business, is proud of their image, and that's literally all we see. That's all I see. That's all I look at on social media. That's all I, the the people that I you meet face to face. And so I do have definitely a warped view of where where men are at. The men who are overweight and and obese, I'm not on Instagram. <laughs> like it, they're they're not in the dating game in that way. And the statistics around men in the dating game and sex for men is like. It's brutal, you know, the the way that things are now. Every attractive or half attractive woman is massively in demand or, you know, has a an easy market of people reaching out to them and then the opposite for for men who are at the bottom end, like the bottom eighty percent of men are in a tough place right now. And um I don't think there's any answer other than improving ourselves, like getting after it and, and being the kind of men that women are looking for. The good news is that most men aren't really trying. I work with the ones who are and who are willing to to get after it, to invest in themselves. Uh, it made me think I, I should start a fat club. That was what it used to be called in the in the rugby days, is if, if a player turned up fat after preseason, they would be in fat club, like after the <laughs> off-season. They would be in fat club for the, the preseason. In these politically correct times, that might be the best name for like a free program to help the men that – clearly don't want to be in the bodies that they're in to get better information and to have some social support because in that rugby environment when you're in fat club and everybody knows you're in fat club and you turn up at 6 a.m when the other boys come in at 9 or 10 um, there's an incentive to change and there's no incentive for for a lot of men to improve themselves and i don't do well in that environment you're not in that environment where no one cares if you get a bit fat or if you get a bit weak or lazy or whatever we're meant to have this import, this environment around us where we're important. Like if you live in a small village and there's some chance that during your lifetime, the men from over the hill are going to come and they're going to decide to take the women and the children. If that's happened at any time in recent centuries and it's rec recorded in your cultural history, then everybody knows, let's be ready. And, you know, in the Philippines, there were, there were knife fighters in every village. And so when the Spaniards came, 
they wanted to take the Filipino knife fighters with them all around the world because they were good at protecting themselves. And these things were built into the culture where if you were the shitty knife fighter, like, I guess it doesn't end well. Like, it, you don't really want to be the weakest link in a village scenario. And we've come to this time of massive isolation, social isolation and anonymity where you don't, no one's pulling, you know, you don't get to have that knife fight. You don't get to have that opportunity to, to test yourself. No one cares whether uh, you're able to defend yourself, or whether you're able to stand up. Uh, it's not a healthy thing. I, you know, everyone's talk, there's a lot of talk about improve your diet and get to sleep and you know, do your strength training and all these things and get your sunlight and do your breathing and earthing. And the number one thing and the thing that's more important than any of them by you know, many factors is that other men care whether you're holding a standard or not. Like that's what matters. You can get by on any diet, on any sleep schedule. Like that's what hell week and these things are. It's like you'll get through it if you have to, if it matters. And you've you've had those scenarios as an athlete. Every athlete has had times where it's like, wow, it's going to be really hard to get after today. And then you do. And and that's how it has to be. And if, if we don't have that social environment, we don't feel good. It doesn't matter which diet you're on. It doesn't matter if you're earthing. It doesn't matter about all this stuff. If no one cares, the thing that all these guys who are, who are sharing this idea – they they think they're sharing the best thing, but the best thing is the fact that they're leading and they know that other men are listening to what they're doing. And so they get that feedback. Joe Rogan has ultimate accountability because he's on TV. You know, he's got more people watching him than anyone else. So of course he's going to do some training. Of course he's going to sort himself out if he gets a bit chubby. Of course, you know, like he's got that ultimate accountability. So the number one thing is that is that social side. And that is that's what I know I need. And, and that's really like the, the secret source of, of what I'm doing and why I've always had exponentially better results than others. Even when I was coaching hockey teams, when I was 19 years old and was coaching the under 15s and whatever, I've always had better results. And I looking back, the thing is the setting standard. The thing is like looking for the weakest points, coming up with novel solutions. But ultimately if, if you, if you if you're willing to do what others won't if you're if you've set a standard for yourself then eventually you win and in life you don't have to actually be the best you just need to be in the top few percent like if i have a good fitness business doesn't mean anyone else can't have a good fitness business you can't solve like and take the whole market so winning in life is actually much easier than winning in sports but men think they need to win in sports when they really need to win in life like you need, you really need to win the thing of getting your own income, you know, being able to be in a strong financial position where if something happens, you can make moves. I'm in Paraguay at the moment. You can think about why I'm here and you can ask me if you want, but I'm traveling the world. I'm looking for what what's happening next and how to put myself in the strongest position for my family, but also for all the people that I'm working with. It's like we need to have different scenarios covered. And, you know, the best way to do that is to put yourself in a strong position. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can see I'm, you know, this is my thing, man. It's like the athletic stuff is, is fun and I still want to push professional sports forward. But when someone wins in, in business and they really get themselves organized, like they win for life. Then once you know you can do that, once you know you can generate income and you can be self-reliant, then you keep that forever. Your Olympic career is going to end. Your business career is not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so I, I think that was one of the pieces I wanted to touch upon was uh, you've helped so many people be financially free. Um, what What is the big, and maybe there's a couple pieces to it, but what, what are the few things that stand out to you that, that put people in that position to be financially free? Someone asked me this the other day, and I, the answer I gave was like one value, like continue to become more valuable. Everyone's thinking about how I can get money, but you don't need to think about that. Listen to the Mr. Beast podcast with Joe Rogan. All he talks about is making things better and better and better. Now, is he really solving a problem? It gets attention, whatever. But he's getting better and better and better at his craft. And so he doesn't need any money. Any company in the world would let him advertise for them. Any podcast will have him. Any, everywhere he goes, he's got opportunity. And he doesn't need money. What he needs is to be valuable. What he needs is network effect. We all need to be valuable and to have network effect around us where other people value our time, our skills. 
And so give it all away. Like that's what Ben Patrick did better than anyone else. He gave his whole program, his whole system away for the first few hundred thousand followers. And then, you know, he's rotated his content since the start. He takes his old posts down. The content now is not as comprehensive as far as delivering the whole system as it was in the early days, I would say. Like it's probably fair to say. But until lots of people care about what you're doing, like give it all away, put it in front of as many people as you can. And then once it starts being good, then you can consider holding some of it back. Men are holding it back before they have anything good. And that stops them iterating to become valuable. Jordan Peterson Mm. talks about like you need to write essays so that your ideas can be tested. Now, I don't necessarily think that I write essays, but I speak my work, my truth, and I put my ideas out there and people push back and and I get, you know, questions and, and whatnot. When you decide to not be a playing character, then you don't get that feedback loop. And so you can't be, you can't become valuable if you're sitting in the background, like better to have a fat Instagram and put yourself up there every day being fat with your shirt off because you're getting a feedback loop and you're creating more of an environment that you're likely to change. If you don't want to be fat, if someone wants to be fat, you're good for them. It's not, I'm not uh, here to to die on that hill of no one should be fat, but maybe it's a a good thing if there's uh, food shortages coming, I'm going to be hungry before some. Um, But so the one thing is value, right? Like if you just focus value, 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 how do I get value out? How do I be good at something? Whether it's good at reels, whether it's good at copywriting, whether it's good at, you know, being an amazing impersonal personal trainer, it takes about four months to be excellent at something. Most people aren't excellent at anything and they just have not decided to put a lot of focus into it. There's a Harvard study about, about it. It really only takes four months. And all these college degrees, it's a massive scam. It doesn't take as long as it's all drawn out to be. And then it's, they're only really conditioning you to go get a job. Like the whole schooling system is conditioning you to go get a job, which you don't want anyway. Life is much more fun being self-reliant. Men are programmed naturally to be self-reliant and to be resentful of jobs. So value is, is one. And the other thing is like, keep some of the money that you earn. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's not rocket science, but nobody does it. And, and it's a funny, it's a really funny thing. Like my mentor said this to me, a, a serial millionaire, an Australian millionaire in many different businesses. He's 70 something years old now. He's not on Instagram. People ask me, what's his Instagram? He's not on Instagram. He's not anywhere. But he taught me, you buy stuff and then you don't, you never go back to it. If you made the wrong decision, you live with it. You just buy stuff and you never go back. I was like, never go back? Like, if I buy something, I want to go up so then I can sell it and buy something else. And he's, and he's like, no, no, you buy it and then you, you never plan to use it. If you want something, you get the money for it. And this mm. is his philosophy. And you think about it, it's like, well, if I was to do that from 15 years old, you know, what would I have by the time I'm 25? You buy you buy an ounce of gold here or an ounce of silver or you buy a, a few satoshis or you you put away some fiat under your bed and you know, pray that inflation doesn't turn it into Venezuela or Argentina. But <laughs> whatever it is, like if you're betting on a bunch of things, like it's not all going to go to zero. If you're buying baseball cards or if you're buying precious spoons or it doesn't really matter. If you have that idea of some like I consistently buy things that I'm never planning to sell. Mm. Then you're, you're not going to be poor. I speak to so many men who's like literally like yeah I've got 500 bucks, bro, or like I get paid on Friday and then I've and then I'm going to have 200. dollars It's like that that's 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 slavery. Like that that's but it's not imposed by the system. It's it is by design of the system. It is uh, the social engineers have set it up that way because it's not like that in many cultures. I, I talk about this to Indians. And they're like, no, that's not how it works. Like my parents live on 50% of their wage and 50% of it goes under the mattress. <laughs> and mm. like, no one lives like that in the West. And, it, and it's, it's part of the blessing as well, of like risk it all and just get after it. But if, if you at least put that policy in place for a certain period of time of like, okay, I, I buy something each week that I'm never planning to sell. It doesn't take that long before you get to a position where you're not uh, – you know, easily coerced and having a mortgage is, is not having an asset. The bank holds the title to the mortgage. So you can win in property and people win in property, but the common way to do real estate is I buy a house, I live in it and I pay the mortgage off for 30 years. And so I never buy anything else because all my money goes into the mortgage. I never, I hear about Bitcoin. I don't buy any, I hear about whatever. I don't, I don't you can't get involved because everything goes into the mortgage where I would rather live in a caravan or sleep in the back of my car or 
you know, the family's going to be happy. We lived in a tiny little house in, in Montenegro, you know, sleeping in a, uh, it's like four by four. We slept in it for two months. Children at the time of their life, there's a trampoline there. The, the gym's like 10 times bigger than the house that we're staying in. But it's it's not the material stuff that's going to make you happy. It's the material stuff that's going to make you miserable when you pile it up at the cost of being able to do things that you want in life. So that's that's two lessons. Uh, and, 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 yeah, if uh, if people have a better one and they want to add to it, I'd love to hear their, their suggestions as well. But it's a pretty simple okay. formula that, you're going to be all right if you can manage that. Mm. And just, just to kind of cap that off too, it, speaking of real estate, um, you clearly have started to buy and purchase. And I know you lightly brought this up, but I, I have been interested with the, it looks like you're starting to build small countries. <laughs> can you elaborate on what you've been doing? Facebook deleted one of my accounts because uh, I said uh, it's, uh, starting a new country, so we can't we can't <laughs> talk about it in that way. It's kind of joking. Put it in the bio, and the account got deleted. So lost like five thousand followers, and where the business was mostly coming from. So you can't uh-huh. talk about starting new countries. But um, yeah, we 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 you know getting land around the world, putting gyms and cool places to to stay, saunas and. Um, the thing is like you can buy things much cheaper in many parts of the world and what I found is that what people value most is experiences they don't really care whether it's in a rich country or a poor country if they're around good people and they can do the things that they value then, then it doesn't matter too much and so I would like to have these locations we call them uncommon villages and the concept is that there's a location for men to go and get after it, train hard, build businesses. And then nearby there's a location for families and you know where families can, can be connected. And the goal in the end is to have education systems and food systems, not to be cut off from everybody else, but to be able to live in the way that you know we we want to live. Um, the details of how all that unfolds, I don't know. You know, like there's a lot of mystery, there's a lot of challenge within that, but it's fun to be acquiring real estate. I wish I'd have started earlier in that way. I don't think of it so much as like real estate plays that look in a sell, but you can see what's happened with Bali Time Chamber. That it's pretty much in the cheapest part of Bali that it, there's a really successful business and it shows the model. The model is you, you get you know, cheap real estate and you put what men want on it and you – the challenge, like, because a lot of men are thinking about this. Okay, I'm going to start a village. Cool, but the challenge is more so to be able to attract the kind of people that you want to that location. So the challenge is the network effect. So you have to be the kind of person who's going to attract the kind of people that you want to that location. That that's really the, the challenge of it. But yeah, in effect, you get like a five star holiday rate of you know accommodation and uh, you know price point on something that doesn't cost you very much, you know, to, to set up. And we're building in Vanuatu. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. It's also very beautiful. No one's ever died of starvation there is the joke because it's just so much fish and coconuts and wild pigs and um, it's perfect for cattle. And so it's two hours off the coast of Australia. People ask, where is it? It's between Fiji and, uh, and Australia. So it's literally two hours away from Brisbane. I hope that the West holds its stuff together and, and kind of bounces back from the challenges that it's facing at the moment. I think America is going to hold itself together for a long time, but I'm not, I'm not as confident about some other countries, um, you know, with, with, you know, recently the way we've seen things go. So we should, we should each do the things that make most sense to us. And, you know, for a lot of people that starts with just holding some assets that your government can't immediately access if they, you know, they want to like holding for some, you know, it's having some Bitcoin or it's having a bank account uh, outside of where you live. You still report the bank account. It's not about hiding money or paying, you're not paying taxes. Um, but to put hundred percent faith in one country at the moment, it, it doesn't seem like a, an intelligent place to be. And it's not that hard to learn about how things work. It's, you know, wealthy people have been doing it for decades and centuries and uh, you don't have to be wealthy to, to kind of start to make a plan and 
and think about how you can be more self-reliant. So it starts with the physical self-reliance, but it actually starts with connecting with other men who value living a great life. And then you get physically fit and then you figure out how to organize the finances. And the final piece is the, like the spiritual smarter side of things of like how much we can develop our, our brains and our heart, mind connection and, bigger stuff really understand the true nature of how far we can evolve our mentality. And I was just listening to uh, man's possible evolution. Uh, Uspensky, it's a Russian book from over a hundred years ago, around a hundred years ago. And you know, he outlined these different mental states, different levels of consciousness that can be accessed, that were accessed by yogis and, and fakirs and monks but he has what he, what he calls the fourth way where you can live in society and have a family, but still be able to access these states. And I feel as though I've, I've had some experiences around this, uh, but that's kind of the fun stuff that I would actually love to, to get to a point where we've got these village locations and enough guys that got their money together and sorted and, and uh, you know, things are running well enough that we can get into some stuff that uh, hasn't been, no one's even talking about like it's it's not really on the radar i think it was on the radar for classical music and gothic buildings and architecture the the way he explains in that book is that these artworks were exp an expression of consciousness an expression of our understanding of these divine states and we we built them into into like works of art so that they would remain and they have a physical movement system as well actually it's like based off uh, gurdjieff it's these really complex kind of um, dance like movement sequences but yeah this is like this is where I want to get to the point where it's like that learning languages playing guitar um, you know reading philosophy that that's the end game for me but I need like a thousand men who get to a similar position to where I am so that there's this all over the world and um, if that has a flow on effect to, to to make a bigger difference then cool if it's only those who choose it, then cool. Like you have to step into this stuff if you want to experience it. You can't, you're not going to accidentally, you know, reach these, uh, these places with business, with, with diving off 10 meter platforms. Like it's not going to happen by accident, right? Like, so yeah, this is the journey and life is good since I have a mission. There's so many men who feel like there's something big missing. Give yourself a mission. This this mission was there for me since I was like 23. I had no idea how I would do it, but there was somehow a mission in, in my heart, in my mind. It took a while to be able to really you know, even talk about it, but then to build it. Um, it shouldn't take as long. That's the goal of the program. It's like four years, you should be able to do what I've done to get to this point. I don't know what comes after this, but I'll be teaching it once I get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's... That's uh, a lot of fantastic information. I hope the people that are listening um, can really kind of digest all of the, you know, ATG stuff. And then, you know, again, the, the business side is, is where you're starting to build some fantastic empires. And, you know, it's fun watching it from the side while I'm, I'm sitting here in my athletic world. But I know I'll definitely be joining you uh, once I'm done here. But um, thank you. Thank you for joining. And it's been an absolute honor. I know I'll have to pull you on at some point again. but uh it's it's been a fantastic hour to say the least thank thanks for having me on and yeah don't understate yourself i know you're going to do very very well in business you had you've had a great start with with some cool stuff and i know you've you've tasted that drug as well that you're uh you know you're going to be excited for when the athletic stuff um, changes its role in your, in your life because you know there's something cool coming all athletes should have that as well once you get a taste of business uh athletic training it's still fun but it's it's not the same uh buzz but yeah go, go enjoy the olympics and uh yeah we'll continue the journey thank you so much for having me on and look forward to the next yeah. conversation all right we'll we'll talk to you soon thanks keegan thanks, brother.